with clarity and charity. Heard around the world on your Android and Apple mobile devices. The Simple Truth, rising up to explore the difficult topics of real life. Join us as we proclaim the good, the true, and the beautiful with the simple truth of Jesus Christ and His Holy Catholic Church through Scripture, Tradition, and the Catechism. And now, your host, Jim Havens. It is great to be back with you on The Simple Truth. We consecrate everything to the Sacred Heart of Jesus through the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Pure Strong Heart of St. Joseph. Today is Testimony Tuesday, where we bring you real, alive, first-hand testimonial accounts of the life-giving reality of Jesus and his Catholic Church. Our guest today is Steve Wood. He's a Catholic husband, father, grandfather. Steve was an evangelical pastor for a decade before his entire family converted to Catholicism in 1990, responding to a challenge from Pope John Paul II, St. John Paul II now, to strengthen families. Steve started the Family Life Center International in 1992. He's also the founder of St. Joseph's Covenant Keepers, a movement that seeks to transform society through the transformation of fathers and families. Steve's a writer and speaker. He's been a, a radio and television host. He's, he's got a couple podcasts you can listen to. You can learn more about his, all of his good work if you go to his website, dads.org. We're very blessed to have him here with us today to share some of his personal testimony. Steve Wood, thank you for being with us. How are you today? I'm doing well, Jim. Thank you for the invitation. It's great to be with you and all your listeners. Yes, yeah, wonderful. Great blessing to have you here. And uh, we always be begin at the beginning. We start with childhood. What was your early life like, your family, the culture that you grew up in? Well, I lived, I think, a pretty charmed childhood. Uh, I grew up in Pennsylvania. My father was a businessman, but he had grown up in Iowa and used to work on a farm in the summers. So he and my mom bought a farm, and I had the opportunity as a young boy to work extensively side by side with my dad. And one of the things that um, kind of helped me later in life actually allowed me to be open to the whole idea of becoming a minister was my dad was best friends, as far as I can remember, with the minister in our Presbyterian church. And I think part of that was my grandfather was a minister. He was a congregational minister. And my dad obviously was comfortable being around a minister. So like when the men of our congregation would go deer hunting, my dad was the one who would drive our minister up and um, our minister would come out to our farm. We'd shoot skeet together on Sunday afternoon. He was a pretty good shot and a good sportsman. So it opened me up a whole lot. I wouldn't say that our family was um, ultra pious or anything. I can't remember my father ever seeing him read the Bible or anything like that. But we were in church every Sunday, made sure we went to uh, Sunday school, catechism classes. Um, he ran a tight ship. We, um, you know, lived a moral life. He was an honest businessman. And so I have absolutely no complaints. Uh, some people have a very rough childhood. Uh, mine was absolutely delightful. Yeah, so it sounds to me like there would have been a lot of uh, a good environment for a lot of just natural virtue um, from how you're explaining it. But w w I guess at what point did it seem like the, the supernatural came more alive or a relationship uh, with Christ? I guess, what did you think of uh, the person of Jesus as a young person? Um, when was it when you started to even think of maybe deeper questions about who is this Jesus? Well, I remember um, even in Sunday school hearing about Jesus, I was fascinated. And uh, one Sunday night, uh, I spent a long time in front of the mirror with a towel around my head trying to look like a Mideastern uh, prophet. And I walked downstairs to my parents and announced to them that I was Jesus. And of course, they were a little shocked and uh, my theology is a little off, but it was a good intent. Um so as a boy, I believed everything I heard. I had no problems with the concept of believing in God, believing in Jesus. But uh, just as I became a teenager, we moved to Florida, and uh, my life went south very hard, very 
fast for my entire teen years. It wasn't um, a pleasant story, but I'm going to relate it because I know you have listeners right now who are having troubles with a teen or maybe a young adult. And you think, well, you know, God's never going to be able to reach them and this and that. So what happened to me, what started it is that when we moved to Florida, I was almost done with catechism classes when we were living in Pennsylvania. So my dad set up a meeting with a local minister and he assigned my sister and I the Apostles' Creed to read it over, think about it. If we had any questions, come back. And I had a very big question, having been taught evolution in schools, that um, I couldn't square it with the first line of the creed. You know, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I asked the minister, how how does that mesh with what I'm being taught in school? Because I believe what I was taught in school, believe what I was taught in church. The two didn't get together. He really didn't give me an answer other than God is great, which is obviously true. But being a 13-year-old boy, that did not resonate. And I, at that moment checked out of Christianity for my teen years. Uh, I went to church for the next few years, didn't tell my parents about this, but I thought that it basically didn't have any connection with reality. And so my behavior kind of went from bad to worse um, and then worse. And then I went off to the university and um, joined the wildest fraternity at the University of Florida. Um, my best friend and I became social chairman. We created parties that resulted in that fraternity being shut down by the University of Florida for at least a while. And then um, even that fraternity, even though it was the wildest on campus, we formed a subfraternity within the fraternity. We called ourselves the Berserkers. So you can kind of get an idea of what my social life was like started partying Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. And basically it's kind of hard to do any good academic work in college when you're basically studying three or four days a week and blowing the whole rest of the week off. I ended up being on the Dean's list, uh, the lower one, not the higher one, and ended up dropping out of college. Back then Vietnam War was rather hot. You had a choice of enlisting or being drafted, I enlisted in Navy Reserve, and hence uh, I go off to the Navy. And at that point, there wasn't a friend that I had, uh, an acquaintance, a family member who ever thought that I would um, end up having any relation with Jesus Christ. Hmm. Wow. And so um, I guess um, from there, I, well, first, let me ask you this. At what point would you have already been um, baptized by this point, or was that something that was yet to come? No, I was um, actually, I've been baptized twice. This is a little long, uh, further along in the story. But yes, I was baptized as a child, November 21st, 1948. And November 21st is also the birthday of one of my grandchildren. So, he got my baptism Bible. Um, and I think I always knew something was there, even though I was really thrown by that disconnect between God and the real world. And even though I rebelled, I was rebelling. I was rebelling against something. And even though as a boy, I had a great relationship with my dad. We really butted heads uh, during my teen years. Uh, thing got things got close to melting down, and um, he died right right before I dropped out of college. And fortunately, the um, Christmas vacation uh, right before he died, uh, we reconciled and kind of got along on a pretty good footing. Which I'm so grateful because uh, I would have, you know, probably still be suffering today if I hadn't connected at that point. So off to the Navy, and um, one of the things is that uh, I, I was known as a very, very hard partier. And one night during a party that uh, I had co-organized, wild and crazy party following a Gator victory, football victory, uh, it was like something came over me, and I was just sitting there looking around. <laughs> I said, 
is this all there is? Um, Because this is supposed to be a lot of fun. And after a while, this doesn't seem to satisfy or, uh, I mean, what, what do you do with your life? I had no idea, but I knew this wasn't it. And so uh, in the Navy, I started searching and uh, I knew that there wasn't anything to Christianity. That was my assumption. So I started with Eastern religions. Um, I guess you would call it today the um, New Age movement. Um, wasn't called it back then. And then I was stationed for a while in Norfolk, Virginia, big Navy base. And so I found my way out to the Edgar Casey Institute. And just so you know, that's not a good place. Um, some of the things they uh, teach there are a cult. I didn't know it. I didn't have any spiritual discernment, but I started studying everything there. Um, including Christianity, because they claimed they were all Christians, even though they believed in reincarnation and channeling and a lot of other things. And I um, had a personal guru, and he told me that unless I read the Bible, I couldn't move to higher states of consciousness. And I said, look, I grew up in the church. I can guarantee you there's nothing to it. And he says, well, if you want to be enlightened, you're going to have to read the Bible. And of course, that's when changes started coming. Interesting. Wow. We are talking with Steve Wood, sharing some of his personal testimony with us today. We're going to get right back to it when we get back. We're going to have Steve connect the dots to get to that point. When did he hear that call of Jesus to then repent and believe, to come follow me? When did that become real? We're going to find out when we get back. But so much here that is so relatable. As always, as we head into the break, it's a great opportunity to kind of reflect upon our own lives and to think about what what, uh, what has led us to where we are, where our Lord might be calling us this very day. What do we need to be repenting of? What do we need to believe in when it comes to Jesus and what he has revealed to us? We're going to be right back. Stay tuned. At the Station of the Cross, we are blessed by the variety of donations our listeners generously contribute for our evangelization efforts. From planned gifts to employer matches, we even receive donations through transfers of stock. Please consider giving a gift of stock to help us continue sharing the love of God with our hurting world. If you are being called by God to donate through a transfer of stock from your brokerage account to ours, please ask your broker to contact us at 1-877-888-6279. Your broker will need to indicate the number of shares being transferred as well as the QSIP number of those shares. That's 1-877-888-6279. Thank you for considering a gift of stock to the Station of the Cross so that we can continue proclaiming the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. As a nonprofit lay organization financially independent from your diocese, our apostolate is listener supported. Through your generosity, we are able to inspire countless listeners with the gospel message and help lead them to a parish to be spiritually nourished by the sacraments. The Station of the Cross thanks our supporters who have enabled us to broadcast Catholic programs for more than 20 years. Thank you for your continued support and may God bless you and your family. What you're offering and giving to me, you deserve to get back because you're offering more than I can give. I learned so much through the station on the cross. I listen to the radio station daily and I absolutely love it. I was attending the chapel and places like that and through your programs I was able to find out how other Protestants had come back into the Catholic Church. God bless the station of the cross. Donate today at thestationofthecross.com. Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here on this Testimony Tuesday with our guest today, Steve Wood. He is the founder of the Family Life Center International, also St. Joseph's Covenant Keepers. He's a writer, a speaker, radio, television host. Um, He's done so much good work. You can find it all at dads.org. A lot of information there, a lot of good stuff. Leads you to his podcasts as well. Uh, But Steve, we left off in that last segment. So um, you're you're still fairly young, a young adult. You're you're seeking um, truth. You know 
there's something more. You're heading off into Eastern religions. You find that this sort of sect that is uh, sort of blending aspects of Christianity in. They present the Bible to you, of all things. Pretty incredible. And so what happened next? Well, as I was purchasing the Bible, the lady who um, took my money put the Bible in a bag, and then she said, I would like you to pray before you read this. Now, again, I was in a new age cult-like place, and yet she, she was very insistent. And I said, sure. And she saw I really wasn't sincere about that. She says, she pulled the Bible back and she says, I want you to promise that you're going to pray before you read this. And is anybody listening to me right now? Then, well, I've read the Bible or I've been to church and heaven seems closed to me. It, it really doesn't matter too much what the exact words are. I have no idea what I prayed, but when I took that Bible and prayed, promising that lady I would and start reading the Bible, well, uh, I, I found the enlightenment that I was looking for, but it wasn't some new age experience. Uh, I came across the Gospel of John. I was reading through the four Gospels, the Gospel of John, chapter 8, and verse 12, where it says, I am the light of the world, and he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And I was kind of looking for light as an experience or it, basically some kind of um, enlightenment, never expecting the light to be a person. Uh, Jesus Christ, the one I kind of turned my back on. So I, I kept reading the Bible, and uh, I, I, I just didn't know what to do with certain things because I knew I was in a lot of trouble. As I was reading the Gospels, then the Epistles, I read some of the Old Testament, and you know I realized that uh, I, I was a sinner, and I, I needed God's grace, and... So I made a long list of all the sins that I could think of and uh, confessed them to God, and uh, nothing happened. And so I just kept reading, and then I came across this thing called the unforgivable sin. I wasn't actually sure what that was, but I thought, well, maybe that's what the reason nothing's happening. So I made an even longer list of sins, very sincerely asked God to forgive me, when I got to the end of that list, uh, a sin which uh, I really didn't think was that big a deal compared to what sins were in my mind, but it was my uh, rebellion and gratitude and disrespect towards my earthly father, my dad. And um, so I confessed that. And in that very moment, the Holy Spirit, open my mind to show me that my problem really wasn't with my dad, but my disrespect, my ingratitude, my rebellion was really directed at God the Father. And at that point, when I realized what I had done towards God, um, basically I broke. I felt at that moment um, I was unforgivable. What, what God would ever forgive somebody who had my level of sinfulness and gratitude, a disrespect. And so I went to bed. The next morning, we were up very early. It was like a 4.30 or about 4.30 wake up call. We were going out to sea. And um, it was like literally somebody lifted a, a load off my shoulders. I literally felt like a new man. I went up to breakfast. My best friend, who was also a fallen away Christian, he said, uh, Steve, when we get out to sea later today, he said, whatever drugs you're on right now, I want you to take those and throw them over the side of the ship. And I said, Jack, I'm not doing any drugs. It's just something to do with it. I've been reading the Bible, and I said this prayer last night, and it's like everything's different. And the scrambled eggs came flying out of Jack's mouth. And the word kind of spread around my ship that uh, Wood had some kind of crazy experience with God, and uh, nobody really knew exactly how to explain it and such like that. Um, I was working in an office, and one of my shipmates came by, and showed me the cover of Time Magazine, which said the Jesus Revolution. And I said to him, what's that? 
And uh, he took off running. I had chased him around the ship to get the magazine and showed all these young people in California that were into all kinds of wild and crazy things or embracing faith in Christ. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I came home on leave on Easter weekend, and um, I went out to the beach, and I spotted at a sunrise service uh, my best friend from the University of Florida. we both gotten in trouble together, both dropped out of college together, both uh, joined the Navy. Uh, he was stationed out in the West Coast, and um, he actually found his way through a conversion experience to this very large church out there, told me about it. And um, after I was discharged from the Navy, I had a couple of options. I didn't know what to do with my life, but I wanted to do something with Jesus. And somebody told me there is this guy. By the way, I visited a lot of churches, and I was very disappointed because I was looking for uh, somebody who took Jesus very seriously, and I didn't have any way to evaluate it. I didn't have any theological knowledge to do that, but I would basically just observe people. Were they reverent before the service began or were they just gossiping or chatting about nothing? I said, how can chat about just things which were meaningless if we're talking about God here? So anyhow, uh, somebody told me there's a real serious guy by the name of um, St. Francis who took Jesus very seriously and he still had some followers uh, left in the world called uh, Franciscans. So uh, I went to the bank, got a roll of quarters. Back then there were no cell phones, went to a phone booth and started calling around the United States um, to find a Franciscan monastery. I finally got one on the phone and then they put the uh, vocations director on. And I said, hello, hello, I'm Steve Wood. I've been reading the Bible. I said this prayer and everything's different. I've decided to follow Jesus and I'd like, I'm getting out of the Navy in like a week or so and I'd like to come join your monastery. It was kind of quiet the other end. And uh, whoever it was, I don't even know where I called, where I ended up getting. And he says, well, in order to come here, you have to be Catholic. I said, fine, I'm Catholic. What's next? And then he said, well, you have to be a Catholic for one year. And I was in too much of a hurry to spend one year waiting for anything. So it ended up taking me 40 years to find the Catholic Church. So Instead, after a few months, I had headed out to California to the Large Jesus Movement Church, which was the center of um, Southern California Jesus Movement. And despite some theology that wasn't, um, you know, squared away, uh, they did have Bible studies six nights a week, uh, went through the entire Bible and Bible studies every two years, had a evangelistic uh, service on Saturday nights for young people. Uh, I became a youth minister, ran the children's education program while I was in college, went to Assemblies of God College out there, uh, graduated, and this time I was got on the other dean's list a little better than the one I was at the University of Florida. And uh, that's that's kind of my life, my first steps. Uh, got involved in a lot of ministry. Later on, I ended up teaching in um, a Bible school founded by Calvary Chapel out in South Southern California. But my real passion uh, was trying to help teenagers not experience what I did during my teen years. Uh, I, I said I decided there was a way to avoid this, and it's through a solid commitment to Christ. So I decided to go back to Florida, uh, exactly where I got into trouble, and uh, started all kinds of uh, outreaches to youth. I did um, prison ministries, beach ministries, college ministries, school ministries, youth groups, that type of thing and uh, became a youth pastor. We had a, what was called a very successful uh, youth ministry. We had uh, kids from about 70 churches in uh, two counties of young people coming to our youth ministry, and people were saying, hey, we've got a, a, you know, a great youth ministry here, and I learned probably the most important lesson of my life regarding teenagers and ministry to teenagers. It's that the best youth ministers in the entire planet are called mom 
and dad. And if mom and dad are on board with Christ and living out their commitments and stay married, then that's the best youth ministry a young person can ever have. And when they would come to a youth ministry like the one I was leading, um, I could either help that process along that mom and dad had established or try to do some first aid to the wounded hearts, which the teenagers were suffering as a result of their parents' life. And so that really set me on a path, uh, kind of surprising. All I was trying to do was to uh, atone and reach out to teens to help them guide a path different than one I had taken during my teen years. But really, that was the start of a family ministry for me. Outstanding. Yes. We're talking with Steve Wood here. Dads.org is the website. Dads.org. Learn more about his great work. We're heading into the break, but before we get into the break, at this point um, in your life, were you um, had you already discerned, um, had you already found your wife, had you already entered into marriage, it was family, um, you were starting your own little uh, youth group with your wife, or how were things going in that regard? Well, God bless me for taking care of the teenagers. I met my wife uh, smack in the center of one of my youth ministry meetings. Uh, My wife, Karen, of 43 years, eight children, and now 15 grandchildren. Um, We met, and uh, shortly after that, Uh, Much to Karen's surprise, uh, I wanted to be a minister, and she, you know, was going to be a minister's wife, which is kind of a shock when you've never really planned for that. But off we went uh, from Florida to Massachusetts to a seminary called Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. Uh, north of Boston, founded by uh, Billy Graham and a wealthy uh, Pennsylvania oil man by the name of Pew. And from there, we started uh, seminary together. And it was actually a good experience because one of the things Gordon Conwell did is had evening classes for wives and taught them basic uh, theological vocabulary and this and that and what their husbands were learning. So you could have conversations with your wife which for me turned out to be beyond invaluable because when we started investigating Catholicism, my wife Karen was the only one knowing what I was thinking about. And you need to talk about it with someone and you need to be kind of careful about it when you're a Protestant minister thinking making this kind of leap. Yeah, amazing. We're going to be right back with Steve Wood. We're going to hear about how he did uh, enter into the Catholic Church finally, and uh, how God has used him in so so many great ways uh, to really pour forth his grace, specifically uh, for for men as fathers and as husbands and and for families. Uh, Really, really incredible work, much needed, obviously, in our time, more and more and more. And um, and I just want to say a word here that, um, you know, what a blessing it is when we can say yes to Jesus's call in faith. We don't necessarily know where he's going to take us next, but if we say yes, he will guide us. Have faith. We're going to be right back. Stay tuned. This is Life News Radio. I'm Jim Anderson. Officials in New Orleans are being accused of violating oaths of office by picking and choosing which laws to enforce and which abortion laws to not enforce. Officials in the state capitol are taking the argument to the next level. They say if New Orleans will not enforce state abortion law, they will not benefit from state lines of credit for infrastructure. The Secretary of State is calling for impeachment of prosecutors and city officers. 30 days post row, Wyoming Wednesday will trigger its abortion law banning abortions and polls show Kansas voters seem intent on voting to deny that there is any constitutional requirement for funding for or right to abortion. Three years ago, the Kansas Supreme Court issued a ruling much like Roe v. Wade that found abortion hidden in that state's constitution. The vote to reverse that is Tuesday, August 2nd. This is Life News Radio. Isn't life an awesome gift? Married couples have the power, the right, the calling to co-create an eternal life with God that will last forever. God has also designed us so that we can order our families effectively, naturally, and without the artificial means of chemicals or barriers. Register for classes in NFP, Natural Family Planning, near you, online at ccli.org or call 800 745 
800-848-8252. Vice President Harris is traveling the country demanding more abortions and passage of a bill critics call the Abortion Without Limits Up to Birth Act. An awkward gaffe exposed the eugenic motivation behind the legislation when the vice president lamented, women are getting pregnant every day in America, and this is a real issue. For pro-life headlines delivered to your email address daily, sign up at lifenews.com. This has been Life News Radio. Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with Steve Wood sharing some of his personal testimony with us today on this Testimony Tuesday. You can learn more about Steve and all of his good work by going to the website dads.org, dads.org. All right, Steve. So um, I know a lot happened um, from seminary going forward. Whatever you want to share that can lead us into connecting the dots of uh, of how it is that you became um, Catholic, how you how you came to know that um, yes, Jesus was the real deal. You had that, but that he also had instituted a church. It was still going. It was the Catholic Church. How did that all come to be? Well, it was the grace of God. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't me. It was the grace of God. One thing I, I found out uh, as I was coming into the church um, through the pro-life movement, I had a priest friend. I expressed an interest in the Catholic faith, and the bishop set set up a meeting with me with a Carmelite priest to work with me and my family to, if, if we wanted to come into the church. And the first meeting, I went by myself, a little nervous. We had a little priest, Protestant minister, small talk. And he said, uh, where'd you do your theological training? I said, a place called Gordon Conwell Seminary up in the North Shore, north of Boston. I said, you probably never heard of it. And he looked at me and smiled and said, I taught there. And lo and behold, um, the seminary campus had been owned by a Carmelite order. And they were praying for vocations and service to the church, to this boys' school they had. It wasn't happening. So in great frustration, they... um, put the campus up for sale and here comes Billy Graham and a bunch of evangelicals. And so they're so discouraged and I can't help but think that God in a great sense of humor, um, like I was pretty hardcore in seminary uh, against Catholicism. Um, One of my friends who your listeners will know, Scott Hahn, we were in seminary together. He was ultra hardcore against Catholicism. And, And it's like God, through those prayers of the Carmelite fathers, took the most anti-Catholic seminarian, um, seminarian and made them Catholic. So um, what for me, I kept as a, I came back to Florida, I was a church planner, which means you start a new congregation. And I kept searching for what makes the family stable in the modern world. Because of my youth ministry, I continued as a Protestant pastor to be very concerned with helping families, helping couples stay together. And I started uh, the most dangerous thing a Protestant pastor can do. Uh, I started reading the early church fathers and not church history textbooks because Probably the greatest difference that at least I have found between Protestants and Catholics isn't just theology books, it's church history textbooks. And what you need to do if you want to find out about the early church, my recommendation is simply go and read the Church Fathers, which I started doing. And I wanted to particularly explore what the early church felt about marriage. And I saw there was a very universal very steady, very settled, absolutely sure view of Christian marriage. And one of those was the indecidability of marriage. Uh, Christian parents have to stick together, valid marriages. And that's exactly what I had discovered the hard way through youth ministry and the struggling and kids who were experiencing a, a home breakup. And this is not what I was taught the Greek says in the New Testament in my Protestant training. And so I'm grateful for my seminary training that taught me to kind of think and know the original languages. And then through the church fathers, I started seeing that um, uh, this is not so. What what the early church believed, and I'm not just the first, second century, I'm talking about the first thousand years of the church. There's no questions about these things. And so uh, I was preaching through the Bible 
in my congregation taking one book of the Bible every Sunday and preaching a sermon from it, starting in Genesis, going right through to Revelation. And I got to the book of Hosea and uh, the book of Hosea, the prophet's marriage, uh, his wife went off and became a prostitute. And that was a sign, her adultery, the failed marriage, unfaithfulness in marriage was a sign of Israel's apostasy. And what was going on in the covenant community, the Old Testament Jewish people or at the New Testament covenant community is the church, apostasy and adultery go hand in hand. And uh, I had a crisis. I, I, um, um, I, I didn't know how I was going to preach this sermon on Hosea because I wanted to be very faithful to the text. I preached the sermon. I thought, okay, got through that. And I sat down for the longest five minutes of my life. And I don't hear messages from God through the ceiling very often and such. I was sitting there for an offertory, and we we're about to have the Lord's Supper, which is communion. And communion is the symbol between Christ and his church, very similar to the covenant communion between a man and his wife. And if one is broken, the marriage, the communion should not be taken. And um, God simply said to me, you're not doing this. And I realized that if I didn't celebrate communion, what, what's going to happen? So I went up to the communion table. I said to my congregation, I apologize, but I'm not prepared to um, administer communion today. And pronounced a benediction and walked out. And the elders followed me right into my study and said, what's up? And I told them. And they said, well, and they were my friends and they weren't mean about it, but they said, you know, you're done here. And I says, I realized that, that I had just basically cut myself off the knees of being a Protestant pastor. And who's going to have somebody who doesn't want to minister the Lord's Supper, even though we had gone to a weekly Lord's Supper and pattern to even the early reformers wanted to do. And so that week I felt like I was in no man's land. Here was a man who had I basically done my training and wanted to serve the church, and I felt like I was without a church. And just to um, basically uh, find somebody that I could connect with, I had a copy of the Vatican II and post-Vatican II documents on my bookshelf. Never read them, but I had them there just to be kind of semi-ecumenical. I pulled them off. I said, what does a Catholic church believe about marriage? And I came across John Paul II, now St. John Paul II, the role of the Christian family in a modern world. And uh, it was just like an explosion. It changed my life because everything I experienced and learned about the needs of teenagers as a youth pastor, everything I had learned by studying the Greek New Testament and the early church fathers, here was a modern pope just standing like a rock in the midst of a raging sea in the modern world for the indissolubility and sanctity of marriage. And basically, I was hooked. And um, um, called. Uh, I had two friends from seminary who had converted by that time. And uh, I said, I don't want any Catholic theology books, but I want all the books you have on Catholic marriage and family life. And of course, I got some of those, but a friend said to me very prophetically, because your views of marriage are going to affect your views of the church. And that's just what Hosea's message was. The two are interrelated. And so um, it wasn't hard for me. I didn't, you know, Matthew 16, Peter being the rock, that was so easy. I knew the Greek. I knew it, what it meant. It meant Peter was the rock. But beyond that, I saw St. John Paul II was a rock. I mean, literally a rock where it really mattered in the modern world. So that wasn't a problem. Um, John 6, really, if you just quit dancing around and read the early church fathers and you can read any English translation of John 6 or read the Greek New Testament, and it's a real presence there, and things started falling down. I had a lot of trouble with justification. That's the one that took me a lot of time. He ended up read, writing a book on that uh, for the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Revolution. It's called Grace and Justification. 
and um, ended up um, coming into the church on January 1st, 1990. I'm blessed my whole family came in with me, and uh, Bishop John Nevins received us into the church and um, uh, had no idea what I was going to do as a Catholic, but it was like, and it wasn't a very uh, comfortable experience because, I mean, I had friends who I had led to Christ. I had friends who I'd led into the Protestant ministry who literally thought I went off the cliff, thought I'd lost my mind by becoming a Catholic. And so it, it was kind of an upstream swim, but I knew it was the right direction because it was truth. And what would happen after that, I wasn't quite sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely amazing. I mean, we're so used to hearing more about the the, the stories of folks that, um, that that disagree with the church's teaching on marriage, not necessarily because of the objective truth of it, but simply because they want to do the sin of adultery. They want to get out of a, a marriage and go do something that they feel like doing that goes against what the church teaches, and it ends up leading them away from Jesus, leading them away from his church. For, for you, just the opposite. Uh, the truth about marriage leads you into the Catholic church, and um, and that really all goes back to because you were looking for how do I how do I share the how do I help the good of the children, um, and how do I build up the family? Right. And so, looking at it from that vantage point, you can see that objective truth quite clearly. When you were presented with it by Pope John Paul II, um, it just uh, it came alive as such a blessing for you. It's it's such a beautiful story. So going forth from there on that same theme, how did that help you going forward in your your ministry and your work to to build up families? How did now being Catholic in the Catholic Church, having that that fullness of truth, how were you able to do a better job of building up the family from there? Well, it was St. John Paul II again. Uh, not too long after we converted, a businessman came to me who I had only known for about 12 hours. And he said, after we met last night, God spoke to my heart and said, you're supposed to go to Rome and meet with John Paul II. And I thought, whoa, we weren't doing drugs at dinner. I mean, where, where did this come from? Because this was 30 days before I became a Catholic. He told me this. I hadn't told anyone what I was about to do. And so a few months later, uh, I was on a plane to Rome with a ticket paid for by this businessman. And I did meet John Paul II. It was the Pontifical Council for the Families, first pro-life summit. It and for some odd reason, um, I got there. And uh, there I heard John Paul II say that God is the author of life and you can't end abortion and euthanasia and all the assaults of life by just simply attacking the problems. The problem is God is the author of life and the modern world has departed from God. And you can't end all these things until you bring the modern world back to God. And I thought to myself, oh, boy, that's an impossible. I've, you know, I've done all types of evangelism and outreaches. And, you know, evangelism is very tough. But then he said the magic words. He said, and the way to bring the, ma the modern world back to God is through the family. And um, I knew I had my marching orders for the rest of my life. Uh, went back to the U.S., uh, thought about it for a while and launched Family Life Center, basically implementing um, the Catholic vision of the marriage and then trying to uh, provide for Catholic families very, very practical things that they can use to fulfill what the church wants them to do. And uh, <laughs> really, I, I, I didn't know where this would go or what would happen, but it was kind of like a runaway horse and all I could do is just hang on to it because there seemed to be a great hunger amongst Catholics to find the practical ways to live out church teaching. And that's really what I've tried to do. Uh, and that was in 1992, we launched the Family Life Center. So mm -hmm. it's been a while, 30 years. Yes, yeah, tell us a little bit about uh, St. Joseph's Covenant Keepers. How did that come to be? Well, it's because I'm such a slow learner, Jim. Um, I went to all these Catholic family conferences my first couple of years as a Catholic, speaking to wives on how important fathers were when men weren't there. And I thought something needs to be done to reach Catholic fathers. So we developed a whole new strategy. That's how St. Joseph's Covenant Keepers was born 
just two years later, and that really became a focus because guys weren't coming to the family conferences. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to pick up there when we come back with Steve Wood, dads.org. Dads.org is the website. Also, if you want to call in, if you have a question for Steve that you would like to bring forward here, 1 877 511 5483. I'm sure so many in the audience have benefited from Steve's good work. If you have a, again, a question for him, you can call or text it in 1 877 511 5483. We'll be right back. Keep up to date with the shows we bring you each day on the Station of the Cross by viewing our programming grid on our website thestationofthecross.com and on our iCatholic Radio app. Just click the menu icon in the top left portion of our app and select the link to our programming grid. That's at thestationofthecross.com and on our free iCatholic Radio app for Android and Apple mobile devices. is fascinating, mysterious, complex, and potentially dangerous. Hi, I'm Debbie Giorgiani. And I'm Adam Bly. We're hosting a new show Saturdays on the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. We'll help you uncover some of the mysteries and answer your questions about angels, demons, eternal life, and how the spiritual and the physical worlds interact. Join us for The Spirit World every Saturday at 11 a.m. right here on the Station of the Cross. The Station of the Cross is listener-funded, and we value your ongoing generosity. In this fast-paced world, it's easy to let your reoccurring donations slip due to something like a new address or a card number change. If you suspect that we do not have your up-to-date donor information, you could check with us during regular business hours at 1-877-888-6279, extension 104, or anytime online at thestationofthecross.com. Thank you. Hi, this is Joe McLean, host of the Catholic Drive Time Morning Show. Weekday morning, 7 a.m. on the Station of the Cross. We'll keep you informed and inspired with insightful guests and breaking news stories of the day. That's the Catholic Drive Time. Weekday morning, 7 a.m. on the Station of the Cross and the iCatholic Radio app. We look forward to joining you on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network each weekday morning at 7 a.m. Praise be to Jesus. May God love you. Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with our guest today, Steve Wood, a Catholic husband, father, and grandfather, founder of the Family Life Center and St. Joseph's Covenant Keepers. You can find out more about all his good work at dads.org. And if you want to sneak a phone call in for Steve, now is the time to do it. 1 877 511 5483. That's 1 877 511 5483. But down the stretch, we come here, the final segment, Steve. So uh, the floor is yours. Anything that you want to share, anything you want to proclaim, uh, feel free. Well, the big question is how did we reach Catholic fathers? Because a lot of family ministry, both Protestant and Catholic, is actually a godly wives and mothers ministry with a lot of uh, AWOL dads. And what happened in at the founding of the United States, time of our founding, if there was a, a family article, it was very often written by a minister or some other leader to fathers. Family ministry was regarded basically as a fatherhood ministry. And basically that all switched about the time of the Civil War. And say even today, if like we go to a big box bookstore and they have that huge magazine section, go look for a family magazine. It's in the next to modern brides and things like that. It's not anywhere near anything to do with men and the advertisements are all for women. And so basically what's happened is that the whole concept of family life is regarded as something of a mother's domain. Meanwhile, mothers realize, hey, no, that, no, this is a, this is a duo team effort, uh, mom and dad together uh, working for the sanctification, holiness, discipleship of the family and the children. So what we did is um, just went directly for the dad since, since they didn't see themselves as the primary responsibility for the family life. We just reached out to them as dads and God has put in 
fathers uh, a very deep desire to, to have, see the welfare of their children. And we try to just connect the dots for them, that they're key for the welfare of their family, for the Christian life of their family, for the internal welfare, eternal life of their children. Uh, it's in huge measure up to them. And so uh, we urge them, uh, first of all, to turn back to God and in a, in a sense really challenge these Catholic men to get serious with God the Father because he's the key to their fatherhood. You both share the same name. And John Paul II, I never tire to uh, uh, repeat from the role of Christian family in the modern world, it says the role of fathers in the modern world is to reveal and relive on earth the very fatherhood of God. Ouch, that, that's, that's a huge responsibility. But children are looking at you, Dad. My children and grandchildren look at me to get a rough idea of what God is like. Now, I'm not perfect, and no father, earthly father is perfect, but we're trying to be a good enough image that kids can look at us and get an idea of God the Father. And that's, that's what we try to instill in dads. And it's quite remarkable that um, guys who maybe hadn't been to confession in 5, 10, or 15 years would go, um, go home in a state of grace and go home getting ready to uh, become a real spiritual leader within their family and not just put all the spiritual responsibilities on their wives' shoulders, but share it with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what else, Steve, jumps out to you as something that um, that husbands and fathers, uh, that men need to hear today that maybe they're they're not used to hearing, but but something that they they do need to hear. Is is there something that you can proclaim for us today that we can take to heart? Well, that, that's a biggie. Um, well, men need it straight. By the way, there is the only sociological study ever done that I'm aware of why. Catholic men aren't attending mass in the same proportions that women do it was done by two British sociologists and they called it single fisted preaching. And it was basically talking about the love, the mercy, uh, the goodness of God, which are indeed true, but kind of the, the tough stuff, the stern stuff, like obeying commandments and things like that. Um, that's single fisted preaching. You ignore that and you're losing men in the church. Uh, tell it straight. Tell it direct. Don't be afraid. I remember I was at a um, Catholic men's conference, and our eight commitments for St. Joseph's Coven Keepers, the eighth, after I spent a whole day trying to outline for men that were on their side, well, want to make them successful, we talked about the church's teaching on birth control was really a critical means because, first of all, with birth control, it creates selfishness in marriage that's so destructive and corrosive. The very thing that God intends to bring a couple together in a deep union with birth control, part of that is blocked. And so, any case, uh, one of the leaders wanted to help me out and said that uh, here's an abbreviated version of your commitments, and uh, he zipped off birth control. And I got back up, and I said, look, I want to be able to look in the mirror tomorrow morning. And this isn't an easy topic, but I said, um, I am for your marriage and your family. I want to keep you in your family, and I know what destroys families. And so we're not dropping birth control as part of a vision for Catholic family life. And, you know, Jim, I would assume that just given today's statistics, that probably about 80% of the young dads in that conference were probably using birth control in their marriages. But guess what happened after I said that? I got a standing ovation. They just needed to hear it. And uh, it was very interesting. A lot of times when we go around and mention this, um, that uh, the couple to couple league would come with us and then they do a class for couples about two weeks after our men's conference that um, the guys would have to see the big picture. Their fatherhood is critical for the eternal and temporal welfare of their children. And in order to keep that bond there, the marriage, the covenant keeping is critical for fatherhood and birth control is destructive to that whole process. And so, um, the teachings of the Pope's teaching of John Paul II. Yeah, it's tough, uh, but that's why we need to rock. And, you know, men are big boys. If you treat them like men, you treat the truth in a manly way, they'll hear it. 
Yes, and uh, and Steve, you've been at the forefront of this. We, we St. John Paul the second, and you answering that call really um, in the United States, but really your work is is international. But then you've seen over the years, you've seen these men's conferences pop up, men's groups begin to uh, form within the Catholic Church. Um, this wasn't always the case. This seems like a very very good sign. But where do you see things going? What encouragement do you have for men today within the Catholic? church to to keep this movement going forward yes uh well one of the things um this is really important if i'll I'll develop it if i could um we started out with a real strong emphasis on a, a fatherhood movement not a kind of generic men's movement okay i'm a grandfather but if I was to go to a, a Catholic men's conference with my sons and my sons-in-law, I would want the speakers to address their fatherhood, the challenges of preschool children, school children, high school children, college challenges, courtship challenges. Uh, I would want them to get that. And the way that we got large numbers of men to go to confession, to go home in a state of grace, and they hadn't been in years, years, uh, was because turning their hearts to their children. Uh, the great prophet Malachi said that God will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, hearts of the children to their fathers. But what has happened actually in recent years is that the many men's movements have grown in age, and we really need a, a kind of a renewal of men's conferences for fathers with children still in the home. That's the key. And if you get that key, um, the role of the family is the future of the church and the world, according to St. John Paul II, and fathers are critical for that. So you gotta get the dads where the kids are still open to changing their lives. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Steve Wood, you can find his good work, dads.org, dads.org. Steve, you are a great blessing. Thank you for all of your good work, all all of your your ministry coming on today and sharing some of your personal story with us. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for what you're doing. And uh, Catholic Radio is just a great way. It's a great way for fathers to hear about the faith. Absolutely. All right. God bless you all. Amen.